Hi there. The time has come, the walrus said, to speak of many things. Well, it's about seating racks and all that stuff, but we're going to be talking about marriages today. I think that's a subject we ought to talk about because there's so much of it uh, within the, pol the political sphere. You know, you have uh, Santorum going out to talk, see, like some medieval monk, and people are talking about marriage in a way that upsets me to the extent of saying that really marriage is a kind of a strange construct which really doesn't much exist. Now, just to show you that I'm absolutely right about this thing, I'm going to surprise you. Go to Google. Get your, get your computers. Go to Google and now type in King James Bible. Enter. You'll get any number of entries, but you take the personal news as well as any of the others. And you, you click on that and all of a sudden the screen comes up and here's the entire King James Bible. And it has a search. So just right in the, when the search thing, you click on it. M-A-R-R-I-A-G-E-S, marriage, or marriages, and click and see what happens. In the Old Testament, to your amazement, you're going to find that there are only two references. Two. One is from Exodus. Well, that isn't surprising because it has something to do with adultery, which is one of the commandments. I forgot what the other was, and I don't give a damn. Pretty slim pickings, folks. Pretty slim. They're talking about this Mary as if it was some immensely religious kind of thing. Not so, my friends. Not so. The father, the bride, and the father, the groom come together. They make a property arrangement. The bride gives all kinds of money to the to the uh, to the male side of the to the other family, and you have at this point they an agreement. They say. You're married. Kids go off to the tent and get it up or get it off. Might check the sheets and see that there's an appropriate amount of blood proving that the girl was pure as the driven snow from the start and all the rest of it. <laughs> that, my friends, is marriage. It was a property arrangement. Ah, but I hear you say that Jesus changed all that because of the so-called marriage, uh, the, the wedding at Canaan, the wedding at Canaan where there was the, uh, you know, the making water was changed into wine. But now, once again, this comes from St. Matthew, I think it is. At any rate, what, you go to that source, and what you find is it's a marriage feast. A marriage feast, they're having a meal. That's what that's all about. As soon as they're tanked up pretty good, the kids will go off to the tent, and there's your marriage. Now, marriages didn't really exist uh, existed under Roman law. That's the interesting thing. When people did, had any reason to uh, solemnize the marriage for legal purposes, they did it under, under uh, Roman law. So that was how that was done. Other than that, always the same thing. The father of the bride, father and groom come together, make a property agreement, marriage. It's interesting, you know, when you think about it, the uh, People got married in, a, in pretty much this way, including priests and bishops. Bishops uh, got married and not only got married to one wife, you had uh, polygamy. Throughout the Bible you have polygamy. Let's go back a little ways to, let's say, somebody like uh, David. He had ten wives. Or no, I beg your pardon, he had ten concubines. How many wives he had, I have no idea, but certainly tell you this, that Solomon had uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines. The guy was a really, he was a, a, a horny devil. I don't know where he got time enough to be the wise man that he was. Maybe there's something wise about having, uh, well, 700 wives. Of course, you know, wives are for the purpose of bringing property into the marriage. Ah, but this doesn't guarantee good sex. So that's the reason you have the, uh, uh, you have the concubines. I guess, uh, <laughs> I wonder if he scored with all the 700 wives and spent his time with the concubines. I think that's probably what he did because, boy, he had a hell of a royal family, I'll tell you that. As I say, uh, well into Christendom, uh, the uh, bishops were married and had families and concubines. Congregations put an end to that. I mean, they decided, now just wait a minute here. here, we, here we're giving all our treasure here and the bishop is guarding our treasure. And what's he doing? Well, they're just raising these huge families. That's out. Just maybe one wife, or maybe one concubine. 
Priests weren't brought into celibacy until the 12th century. That's 1,100 years after the death of Jesus, supposed death of Jesus. It wasn't until the, sometime around 1450 in uh, the Council of Florence that at long last the Catholic Church decided that marriage was a blessed sacrament. It hadn't been before. Now it's suddenly a sacrament. Well, you know, this is a kind of a strange thing, isn't it? How sacred it is. Now, try to find out if you can. Go back to your computer once again, and let's type in uh, God's holy ordinance. Now, you'd suppose it's in the Bible, but it's not. It's not. I think, I only think this. You check it up and get back to me, you know, as you post, post back to me on the YouTube. See if I'm right. I'm not sure I am. But I think it may have come from the... Uh, a Book of Common Prayer, which is the Church of England. So check it out. Start informing yourself on things like this. Now, of course, all this ties to the idea of gay marriage. Well, as I say, since marriage doesn't amount to much historically, one way or the other, I don't see what all the problem basically is, but of course, you know, it's a very important subject uh, from, from a political point of view. I mean, here we are in the United States. We're, terrible, we're in a terrible uh, depression. <laughs> all our Goods are being manufactured abroad. We can hardly afford to import them. We're all going broke. The situation in the Mideast is disastrous. And what are we doing? We're worrying about uh, gay marriage. And none more so, incidentally, than the good Archbishop Niederauer of San Francisco. And so in order to, uh, to defeat a law which is passed by the, uh, the, by the legislature, uh, making it possible for gay marriage, he backed a Proposition 8, which would have taken away all those rights and, and to get rid But he didn't have the money to do it. He got a million and a, a, million and a half from the Knights of Columbus, but that, that wouldn't do it. So he goes tip with a cup in hand to the Mormons. The Mormons, for God's sakes, these people have multiple marriages. They're married all over the place goes to them for the money. They supply it, $20 million. Well, I don't know. It, it's just crazy. There's this much to say. I can think of one gay marriage that would, is, is a really a Lulu, and I recommend you check it out. You'll find it in the Bible. Give me a little second, too. It, it brings a great comfort. If you look in the book of, of uh, Samuel's 1 and 2, you'll, you'll run into David and Jonathan. Jonathan fell in love with David, and to prove his love, he starts taking his clothes off to the point he's stark naked in front of David. And David takes off his garment. They exchanged garments now. Yeah, that's a great one. A little later in the Bible, there's this discussion to the effect of, uh, of their... They're pledging one to the other their eternal love. And uh, they, they, they take a covenant, believe it or not, which incidentally is another, another biblical word for marriage, swearing that by their, by their seed and through all generations and so forth. This is how strong their love. Finally, toward the end, David tells this. News comes to him that Jonathan has been killed in battle and... Here's David. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful. Passing the love of a woman. Now, what I'd like you guys to do, go to, go to a priest, go to a rabbi, go to a, 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 a minister and ask him what that's all about. For those of you here in California, go to William Swing, who's the uh, he's, the big, he's the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, or Steve Pierce is a rabbi of the uh, Emmanuel Temple, or George, or lovely George Niederauer, the tin cupper who goes to, to Mormons for, for, for money. Ask him what that was all about. Now, I could go on about marriage, but you know, you, you, everything that they throw up against people, all these sexual conduct things, I'd like to give you something else to think about and go to these same guys, okay? This is a book of numbers. Now, in the Bible, let's count it up. We go, 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, book number four. Find it here. Let me touch it a little bit here to gain the strength to get to the end of the broadcast. I want you to go to Numbers, book of Numbers, chapter five, and starting at about 13. Now this is very interesting. I want you to check it out because this will tell this tells you how God tells how abortions are to be performed. I repeat, God will tell how abortions are to be performed. Now here's how it works. If a man suspects his wife is pregnant now, you see, and he suspects that he is not the father, but that some other dude is, well, what does he do? He takes the wife to a priest, and you pay the priest. You always pay a priest. That's part of the thing. I mean, you pay the priest, you make offerings, and so forth, and the priest takes a cup, and he goes and he scrapes crap off the, off the floor of the temple or whatever, and puts it, you can imagine what it was in those days, sheep shit, camel dung, whatnot, put there. Add water to it and give it to the wife to drink. Now, if she is innocent and the child is that it belongs to the father, nothing will happen. But if she's been sleeping around and got herself into this condition and it's not the husband's child, she will abort the child, she will abort the fetus and her innards will rot and she will never bear any more children. This is the ultimate abortion. You not only kill the fetus, you kill the, any ability of the woman ever to have uh, a, a children again. I think the, it's such a beautiful book. My grandmother used to tell me how beautiful the book was. I'm not sure she read all these parts. Go to your priest, go to your rabbi, go to your minister and ask him about these things. And then also come back to this very station here on YouTube and let me come and bring you some more tales of horror brought to you, not by Universal Pictures, but brought to you by the Holy Bible. See you next time.